So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the India China Institute's India China Day. This is a very big day uh, for me and for many of you. This is the first India China Day we've been able to do in person uh, since 2019 for reasons you can obviously guess. So it's really a big moment in the history of the India China Institute to return to live in-person programming uh, and uh, to have with us for this program today, uh, seven very special uh, guests and presenters. Uh, these are the recipients of the travel research grants that were awarded uh, last fall in 2019. Uh, they carried out their research over the last uh, 12 months or so and are here six in person and one online to uh, share with you briefly, we've only given them five minutes uh, hardly enough to do justice to their, uh, their really interesting projects and their findings. But I hope uh, afterwards, uh, when we have time for questions and answers, and even when we have time for refreshments, uh, we can, uh, you'll have a chance to talk with them individually uh, with questions and, and comments on their, on their research. I will also save time by not uh, reading each person's name and department and title. You have an agenda with you and uh, the, the people who are online. I know uh, Layla is online and will present uh, virtually, uh, but I will save time on that and we'll um, now uh, briefly turn it over uh, to Grace Ho, the Deputy Director of India China Institute. Do you have any, for some remarks welcoming? Okay. Hosted by the India China Institute. I think, um, as Mark said, well, this is a big celebrative occasion for us. It has been that long since uh, we are able to do an in person activity, especially student um, activity. It's a tradition, actually, to some extent, for India China Institute to support the student fellowship, to support um, our uh, you know, students at the uh, uh, um, new school community for having this opportunity for this many years. We started at uh, 2006 um, that we started the uh, student fellowship programs. Um, the last year obviously was um, you know, restrictive, but in spite of those difficulties, four of our students were able to make it to the research sites. And all of our people, even if uh, we're unable to go to the sites, people did their research online, did the research uh, through, archival, through archivals. I think, again, you know, the processes of doing this research whether they are presenting a finding, whether they are refining their research questions, or just present the process of conducting this research, uh, hopefully is uh, valuable to themselves, but also um, to our audience, you find it uh, you know, useful to you as well here and there during your research. And obviously we are going to announce the New Year's Student Fellowship for 2023. And through their presentations, hopefully it gives everybody an idea of what it is all about. Um, so with that, we would start their presentation. Each person has five minutes and we will wait until all the presentations done for questions and answers. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chang Liu. I'm a second year sociology PhD student at New School for Social Research. Um, it is a great pleasure to get the, the uh, ICI research grant this year, and it's a great um, opportunity for me to have my uh, presentation here today. Okay, I will start now. Uh, so my research topic is the post-socialist work ethic in China. Um, it is based on a case study of the healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. So uh, I will give a short introduction of the capitalist and socialist work ethic and the history of, uh, especially the history of the socialist work ethic. And the second part is the post-socialist work ethic today and uh, the anti-work politics in China. And in the end, I will um, give uh, a short um, 
presentation of the healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, about the capitalist and socialist uh, reproductive work ethic. And in a, a paper given by uh, Heather Berg, uh, she talked about the work ethic under capitalism and tends to imbue workers with the delusionary belief that working is the only way to achieve the autonomy, independence, and uh, ultimate freedom of yourself. And she uh, proposed uh, the term social necessary debt and to review how workers are evaluated based on the perceived necessity of their work to the reproduction of society and how the work ethic in turn prevents the workers, especially the reproductive workers from refusing work. Um, in comparison, the socialist reproductive work ethic focuses on the concept of um, serve the people and sacrifice. And for example, um, serve the people is primarily an ethical demand in names a requirement for pure selflessness and individual sacrifice, um, ideally through death for the already constituted uh, revolutionary collective. Okay. And here is uh, the precepts from the, the magazine China Reconstructs during the Cultural Revolution. And uh, you can see like the focus of the article here really focus on how the healthcare workers uh, like serve for the people and how they go into the countryside or rural areas and to sacrifice and for the, uh, the interest of the people there. And in, in contemporary society, like China still have this um, legacy or heritage of the, the socialist work ethic, I argue. And especially like you can see during the pandemic, like China also honor the personnel diseased in epidemic controls as martyrs. And now I would like to uh, present some of the like the new trend like uh, during the contemporary society focus on the anti-996 movement and also the emerging culture of a passive refusal um, of the work ethic today in China. And the anti-996 movement is initiated by a group of Chinese tech workers in 2019 to make a public claim denouncing the overtime working culture and uh, the 96 is referred to the working hour system, which requires employees to work from uh, nine to nine, six days a week. And the new culture of passive uh, refusal is also quite um, uh, popular online right now, especially on the social media, like many young generation talking about uh, the lying flat or catching fish as like a way of uh, refuse to work passively. And I also want to present some of uh, the pilot interviews I have conducted yeah, uh, with a gender practitioner. Um, she's uh, in her mid late 20s and worked in Fangtang Hospital um, in Shanghai during the pandemic. And here is some um, interview, like uh, the part of the interview she talked about her um, perception of the owners or her uh, understanding of the work ethic. Like we asked if she and other medical workers she worked with in Fansan received any honors. And she said, I don't know about the other. We don't have the honors anyway. The work unit let me to go there uh, to work. So I went there because I certainly cannot say no. So I just went there, worked there as far as uh, for as far as if I can get honors, it does not really matter. These days it is fine as long as there is no underpayment of our subsidies. So it's like the you can also see like the post work ethic here, like um, uh, as post socialist work ethic here, like the, the medical worker they they are not really convinced by the concept of a sacrifice or um, and becoming more pragmatic about their work. And another part about the propaganda to prepare the propaganda materials for May 4 Youth Day, our work unit asked me if I had any touching star rate in Fangtang Hospital. And she said, oh, I don't have the touching star rates. And her uh, supervisor say, I think again, are you sure? I think, no, I really don't. And he said, I'll then just write a program saying that when you arrive at Fangtang Hospital, how panicked you are and then how you overcome the, overcome the difficulties. So it's like, um, for the workers, medical workers, they kind of reject or reluctant to the, 
the uh, social rights work ethic, while for the uh, the state or the propaganda agency, they still kind of stick to this kind of concept and ideas. Okay, uh, thank you. That's all. Yeah. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, so my title is uh, At Sea Forging Empire with Coal and uh, Water in the Western Indian Ocean. I'm going to jump in very quickly. Um, this is the geography uh, that I want you to pay attention to. Now, you'll find Mumbai, uh, you know, the Gulf of Aden, uh, the Red Sea, Cairo, and then to, uh, to London. So that was the shipping route uh, that the East India Company sort of favored in the age of steam, rather than sort of circumvent the continent of Africa via the Cape of Good Hope, which is not in the map. It's it's around about. Uh, so steam and this particular route changed the dynamics of uh, the political economy of empire. And you know it was thought that this kind of intensified and accentuated the rise of the British in South Asia, as well as in the, in, in the Middle East. Um, and the, the archives, I, I sort of, I went to Mumbai, I went to the Maharashtra State Archives, as well as online resources. Uh, and one of the, the two main things which constitute empire is, of course, this, this geography that they had, that the British, uh, that the East India Company had kind of constituted, right, which cut through uh, Egypt and into the Arabian Sea. Two commodities were extremely important for this process. One is coal, because uh, a lot of this, the ships would use steam and water, because coal without water is just carbon. Um, and you also needed, they also needed water to you know, to provide for, uh, you know, for their uh, uh, workers on, on the ship, basically. That was a key provision and a scarce one as that, at that. Now, there were two actually places which are important here in this, in this particular imperial geography, which is uh, Aden. Um, and you can see Aden over here in the south, as well as um, Narmada, which is, um, over here, the, the river, the, the Narmada River here. This map is a better description because you have Narmada, which is in the south of Gujarat. They take, I mean, they try to take coal from there to Mumbai and from Mumbai to this point in the Gulf of Aden and from there to Cairo and an overland route to Alexandria and from there to the Mediterranean and then to Europe. Um, so the, you know, the, the role that Aden played, which is sort of, you know, it kind of held the empire together, you know, as a coaling station for refueling and repair, as a military and strategic route um, that connected, uh, e that connected, you know, Egypt to uh, the Red Sea to the rest of Europe. And, um, and if you, if, if the British lost the Red Sea, they would essentially be cut off from, from the Indian subcontinent, um, and they would have to go around the Cape of Good Hope again. So this was extremely vulnerable, a choke point, really, a point of real um, like skirmishes and fights with the French and with the with even with the with the with the with the tribal groups in Aden. Um, this is one of the first sort of uh, not one of the first actually. This is in like eighteen forty two uh, a, a description of passengers who traveled from uh, from Suez and Aden to Mumbai. Uh, to Bombay, what was then known as Bombay, and you can see it's a quite mixed. You have reverends, you have military officers, you have a mix of men, uh, uh, ma male and, and female uh, passengers, and also one Parsi, I think. Um, this is this is Aden, um, and in 1839, the British uh, captured uh, Aden. They fought off the uh, they fought off the the, the Sultan of Lahij there, and um, uh, the this is the newspaper which reported the capture. You really can't see anything, but this is a more uh, sort of a, a, a zoomed in version, and you can see that the uh, captain Haynes uh, has reporting is reporting to the British to the to the British government in Bombay that he was successful in capturing Aden. Uh, the skirmishes that took place, the um, the number of you know the people who were wounded and the guns that he captured. This is one of this is the 1856 uh, uh, sort of. Um, a, a sketch, a, a British official sketch of Aden entering the harbor. This is a, another uh, sort of uh, sketch. This is a more, uh, there's a photograph in, in the 1870s, uh, which I think does a better job at kind of fleshing out the, the texture of the place. Um, this is a plan that the British had um, erected 
uh, on over in in Aden to to hold it essentially as a as a point as a military uh, as a as a military strategic uh, uh, geography. That's a particular place. And Aden was 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 a difficult place for them. They were getting into um, the British were finding it very hard to procure water and food. And this is when they tried to kind of uh, this is a sketch of when uh, one of the engineers tried to uh, bore water. Um, in in Aden and and it's a kind of it's a sort of neat uh, I think sketch because you can notice camels and cattle and people working on the uh, on the uh, this one. Um, so along with Aden, Narmada is really important, and it might seem strange that how these two geographies came together. But the Brit the the, the British uh, officials from Bombay launched an expedition to the Narmada to procure coal, uh, they were finding it very hard to actually, they had a lot of problems with European agents, uh, coal agents, uh, they were constantly getting into litigation, the quality of coal was often questioned, uh, transporting the coal would kind of, you know, would, uh, would damage it, etc. So Narmada was explored, and they actually to cut, I mean, to cut the long story short, they failed actually Narmada, um, which is an interesting sort of uh, genre, I suppose, of failure, where you look at kind of, when you couldn't kind of look at empire, the, the 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 forefront of I mean the 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 primary image of success and failure is battle is warfare. But here in between 1839 to 1856, 57, they launched a series of expeditions to kind of be able to kind of procure coal uh, from the Narmada, but the, the river completely defeated them. They were just not able to to tame this river actually, which is an interesting story itself, as they were not able to tame Aden. So. I'm going to actually cut. Uh, is my time up? Okay. Uh, this is this is the this is a bit discussion Narmada, and this is again sort of navigating the Narmada. Um, this is a uh, this is a picture of the Narmada River. You can see boats and and sort of rocky formations. This is the kind of topography which the British found extremely hard to deal with. They were not used to this kind of uh, kind of river system, um, and. So Aden and Narmada, right? Both were ruled from Bombay. Uh, both had very similar. So I'm done. Uh, and essentially, the point is that you know, though Aden and Narmada are extremely crucially central India, crucially important for the constitution of the British Empire, both of these were actually choke points as well. Um, and this kind of helps us, I think, rethink the the idea of empire. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone. Um... So since there's uh, very little time, so I'll try to kind of summarize some of the findings um, and the sort of insights I got in my archival research. So I'm Aditi and I'm in my sec third year of the PhD uh, um, in the politics department. And um, wait, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, so this the the I use the travel grant to um, carry out some archival research, and I want to set the context for some of the research interests that I ended up exploring. So I was looking at um, public sector undertakings or public sector enterprises, which are state-owned um, industries that were set up. Um, at the moment of independence in India um, with this purpose of sort of uh, embracing decolonization through, uh, you know, economic self-sufficiency and so on and so forth to kind of produce within, um, uh, to produce within core sectors of the economy and um, set up a technological base in India, but not only just this part of their uh, economic function, but they also played an important role in um, employing in large numbers and also kind of urbanizing many parts of uh, the country. So I was interested in pursuing two questions, which is um, looking at how, uh, uh, what are the sort of transnational and global networks that help in establishing uh, and, and the establishing and developing some of these state-owned uh, industries, especially those that were producing, uh, setting up the technological base for the country and producing capital goods. So um, how are the kind of global and transnational linkages in the 50s and 60s critical for uh, establishing these national uh, enterprises? And the second question I wanted to pursue was, uh, what were the ways in which um, these public sector enterprises, uh, what were the ways in which they shaped urban space uh, post-colonial cities and a uh, socio-technical and modernity. So uh, the two archives that I, um, one second, should I just click on it? Sorry. Um, wait, how did you do it? Okay. 
yeah sorry so the two um, archives that i looked at were uh, the one in delhi and one in bangalore so in delhi i looked at the nehru memorial uh, library uh, which is also uh, an archive that is in um, uh, nehru's uh, sort of uh, house uh, which is turned into a library of um, you know personal correspondences between different political leaders and technocrats and so on and so forth within the country as well as internationally so I look at those papers um, and I also uh, went to the Karnataka State Archives in Bangalore to look at look at the papers of like land acquisition and so on and so forth for um, many of these public sector enterprises because they took up like villages uh, village agricultural villages and forests and wastelands uh, to be able to establish these you know, national and publicly owned um, industries. So this is uh, some of the photos that I collected over there. Um, and you can see that, um, so what, the, one of the reasons why, one of the main reasons why I'm interested in this is to look at the sort of enduring legacy of these public sector uh, in, uh, enterprises in setting up these uh, government jobs and um, stuff like that, which at, uh, at the eve of uh, or after neoliberal reforms, most of these jobs kind of disappeared and became contractual in nature, but also that it's the foot Print that these uh, enterprises had within the city also dramatically changed and you know so um so it was interesting that even when i went there um I was able to find uh, people, uh, I mean, uh, workers who are contractual workers with many of these um, uh, and uh, public sector enterprises or state holding state government jobs that they were also still fighting to get the kind of permanent, you know, permanent position that once was promised um, out of these public sector, the public sector at large, but also public sector enterprises. So moving on to some of the findings that I've uh, had, which was, oh, I have one minute left. Okay, so uh, some of the uh, findings that I had was that at the global level, you you would imagine that a lot of these between, uh, say, the Industries and Commerce Minister and the Finance uh, Ministry, that there were all of these negotiations with different um, power blocks of the Cold, Cold War, which is USSR and uh, US, in order to get um, uh, technical sort of um, machinery, uh, critical technical skills, as well as like funding that all of which India lacked. So while this was like an ideological project, in many ways, it also had this pragmatic side that it had to really bargain and negotiate with uh, several uh, international actors on both sides of the Cold War bloc, as well as IMF and World Bank, in order to be able to get the resources required to kind of, you know, um, uh, come up with these, uh, establish these industries. And the fact that there was a serious Resource crunch, especially in terms of like foreign, uh, foreign uh, currency, uh, foreign exchange currency, right? So the so you can see that like it was actually like a very expedient, uh, pragmatic uh, efforts that were going on in doing that, and like it led to a lot of. Um, you know, restrictions and constraints and so on. And at the level, at the second level that I was investigating this in Bangalore, and I chose Bangalore because before it became the tech hub uh, or the sort of Silicon Valley in India, it was also one of the places in which a large number of public sector industries were set up. So it had this legacy of like state-owned uh, uh, industries and the economic kind of urban economy that it set up. And I realized that in some of the kind of land acquisition papers and um, uh, various things, you saw that like these industries were not setting themselves up in this sort of tabula rasa or like this empty space but in fact that they were uh, kind of negotiating with um you know, urban villages, uh, like different caste communities uh, within these cities, already existing colonial, um, you know, kind of industries and factories. And, um, you know, so they were, uh, had to, uh, uh, had to sort of, you know, go through, navigate all of that to be able to establish themselves and embed themselves within uh, the emerging urban space and the urban economy, right? So, um, yeah, so eventually, I'm uh, just wrapping up, uh, through this research, I want to be able to ask uh, two or three questions, which is that what are, uh, how have these linkages both at this global and local uh, scale um, helped in, or uh, not helped, but laid the foundation for the sort of um, new liberal reforms era, and how, uh, how have they kind of precipitated those in very material, um, direct ways. And the second question that I was thinking about is that um, how have these kind of multiple publics that uh, uh, kind of stemmed from uh, public sector enterprises, how um, how have they been reconfigured with these big changes in the pol Indian political economy? So you can, by multiple publics, I mean like, uh, sorry, I couldn't go through a lot of this, but yeah, like just women or lower caste communities that got employed within uh, public sector enterprises and held these jobs. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with all of you um, about the field work I have conducted um, this past summer um, under the support of India China Institutes. Um, a little tech glitch that often happens in maker communities as well. So <laughs> it's nothing uh, that surprised me anymore. Um, yeah, so uh, during the summer, I managed to secure regular video chats with people who might identify themselves as local makers in Shenzhen. Um, so many of whom are actually acquaintances that I befriended in my mid twenties back in Shenzhen, a period that somehow with the pandemic and everything else going on in the world, now seems like another lifetime. Um, dubbed China's Silicon Valley of hardware, Shenzhen is a burgeoning cosmopolis abutting Hong Kong as the first special economic zone of China uh, that opened itself to foreign trade and investment since the 1980s. This mega city attracts young and ambitious talents from around the world to pursue their dream in the world's Silicon Valley of hardware. As part of the reform and opening up plan devised by the then paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, um, the development of this mega city carries significance in post Mao China's modernization. On January the 4th, 2015, during his visit to Shenzhen, China's incumbent premier, Li Keqiang, dropped by a maker space in Shenzhen that facilitated tools and machinery for link, uh, tinkerers and open source tech enthusiasts who identify themselves as makers, Chuang Ke. According to news reports by a variety of media outlets, the premier interacted with robotic arms created by makers there with great interest. The premier said, your creativity and accomplishments have demonstrated the vitality of mass entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, he continues saying that this kind of vitality and creativity will be the ever running engine for China's future economic growth. For those who are very well versed in governmental discourse uh, that in China, this particular visit by the premier gestured a whole new direction uh, of uh, uh, the kind of plans that the government is uh, thinking about. Uh, to take on. So, um, sorry, just one second. Little did I know back then what it means to be a participant observation of the maker movement. As a 20 something ambitious uh, young person back then, uh, I, I think I thought, I, do I still have time? I just wanna, okay, good. Um, I have always been oddly drawn to the story of how the misfits, the rebels, and the underdog, and, and eventually made it mainstream. Um, so there's something about the identity and lifestyle of being a maker that appeals to me. From 2014 to 2018, I had the privilege to be part of the Silicon Alley, uh, working with Chinese and uh, the expatriate maker communities uh, in Shenzhen. Uh, so these pictures are the ones that I actually, uh, uh, the one that I took uh, back, in, uh, back, in, uh, back in the summer uh, through uh, WeChat um, video conferences that uh, I, sorry, one second. So I have to be very creative because of the pandemic. Um, so I, 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 I turned my methodology as digital ethnography. Hopefully that will be accepted as my proposal. So I did re remote field work um, through WeChat video conferences to zoom in the maker gatherings. And I conduct remote in-depth interviews with makers in Shenzhen, uh, collecting data on gender ratio of makers registered with a major uh, maker space and I observe um, group dynamics um, through uh, WeChat groups. So uh, I, I will briefly talk some of my main findings. So uh, my main findings are the entrepreneurship is still the major concern of the maker communities in China and uh, the uh, maker communities and actually thinking about uh, dabbling into the theme of uh, Web 3.0, which is uh, a very interesting new trend. And I do notice the lack of uh, female participation that still does exist. And that prompts me to think about how gender, sexuality, and epistemic cred credibility actually uh, plays um, into um, the maker movement. And that actually also points me to my future research that I think it would be about sociology of knowledge, uh, economic sociology, and sociology of gender. And I intend, uh, uh, to make my project as a, a science and uh, a project in science and technology studies. 
Uh, so my main research question is how do makers actually demarcate alternative ways of being and living in the midst of tensions between the kind of techno utopian promise of the maker movement um, and, the, and the only present uh, capitalist logic to legitimize um, their activities and to accumulate uh, capitals and to remake their identities um, in different uh, political regimes. Uh, so it would probably be a comparative uh, research between China and the US. And the sub questions would be, uh, how do grassroots maker communities continue to operate in China without governmental subsidies and under stringent pandemic policies? And why are so few female makers active in, in China's maker communities? How do women and LGBTQ makers actually demonstrate their engineering ingenuity and legitimize their epistemic credibility in the tech world? Because one of, um, the, the makers that I interviewed, she is actually, she uh, later on discovered her sexuality as a lesbian. So she divorced uh, her husband and, uh, uh, but she was uh, constantly worried about uh, disclosing her sexuality to the public because she worried about the public uh, perception uh, of her sexuality will actually jeopardize her um, uh, uh, image of being a professional engineer uh, in the tech world. Um, so what are the new trends of uh, technology being pursued by the China's uh, community, uh, maker communities is also one of my main, main concern. And uh, I also need to ask uh, why did a considerable amount of maker spaces dwindle even before the pandemic? And I think all, the, uh, all these points to uh, my uh, suspicion that there's actually, there actually exists this inherent paradox between uh, neoliberal capitalism and open source technology that is being uh, that is also the commonalities between open source hardware and, and Web 3.0, the conception of Web 3.0. Um, thank you so much. Sorry, it's just five minutes. I can't. Um, yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sebastian Anaya. Um, well, my, my, my research proposal um, was about the farmers' protest in northern India between November 2020 and December 2021. Uh, even though it happened uh, mainly in the states of Haryana, Punjab, and Uttar Pradesh, uh, there were solidarity protests all over India um, with um, less in intensity. So I focus as well in some of these blockades uh, in my research. So I analyze the context uh, of the socioeconomic and historical context uh, of this huge mobilization. Um, I analyze the motivations, preparations, and dynamics of this uh, social mobilization. Um, yeah, so it's important to keep in mind that all of this happened amidst COVID pandemic, and it lasted a year. Um, so um, in June of 20, June 2020, uh, Narendra Modi, the president and the ruling party BJP uh, proposed um, three ordinances to the Congress. And doing this was legally controversial because um, agriculture provisions fall under state's control, not the national government, uh, according to the Indian constitution, but they circumvent this uh, arguing that uh, the um, amendments were about trade, not agriculture. So, um, yeah, so uh, in general terms, these three ordinances uh, weaken the public control over supply, uh, distribution, and trade of essential commodities such as oil seeds, uh, potatoes, food grains, which are essential for, for India, uh, India's food security. And, uh, they imposed uh, heavy burdens on farmers uh, favoring traders. And they set food prices according to market fluctuations, re uh, getting rid of the minimum support price policy, which is this uh, floor price that the government establishes every year technically, uh, under which uh, traders shouldn't buy the farmer's produce, um, among many other negative effects. So these uh, amendments were framed or are framed in this uh, ruthless neoliberal, neoliberal and um, corporate state policies that the ruling party is imposing in India for the last decade, eight years. And so um, I, I've been conducting my research mainly using uh, qualitative 
uh, uh, data gathering uh, techniques such as interviews, um, timelines, focus group uh, dialogues. I've been looking for information in um, state office uh, reports such as the uh, general agriculture survey. Um, I've been reading a lot of texts, legal texts, books, uh, articles, essays about the rural situation in India, uh, social movement studies, um, also a critical perspective on neoliberalism and the economy, etc. Uh, before going to India, uh, I contacted many of the uh, farmers organizations that participated in the in the mobilization. But I must say that it was really hard to do it from here because many of the leaders live in rural areas. And that's why um, due to this reason and other reasons, I, I'd say that I can divide my interviewees into, into three groups. So the first group uh, are the members of All India Kisan Sabha, uh, which are the farmers fraction of the Communist Party uh, of India, Marxist. Uh, who were part of the protests and play a major role there. Uh, more than 500 uh, farmers organizations uh, came together and unite and were united under the platform, the Samyukta Kisan Morcha, the platform, um, and the All India Kisan Sabha uh, was a leading national voice. Uh, uh, in, in the, in the nego negotiations and mobilization committees. So, yep. <laughs> the second group uh, is composed of uh, people from civil society uh, who, are, um, who have been studying the mobilization and rural situation in India, let's say scholars or journalists. And the third group, I interview uh, farmers who were not part of the protest, but of course they were aware of what happened and they explain and expose their reasons what, why they weren't part of the protest. So yeah, I'm about to finish. So this is a history uh, of success. Well, it's bittersweet because uh, last December, the uh, Modi have to, Modi's government have, they have to uh, repeal the three ordinances due to the mobilization. But now they are pushing forward these uh, uh, legislative uh, reforms through the state's Congress. Congress. Um, so there is going to be, uh, the, the, the strikes will continue and at a different scale probably. And finally, my, my deliverable <laughs> is a paper, but I'm trying to do it in a very particular way, highlighting the voices of some of, the, of these uh, protest leaders. Uh, of course, I don't want to take over their experiences or their voices, but uh, I want to serve to um, amplify the, their voices. This last picture was with uh, Vishnu Krishnan, uh, who, uh, who is the Joint Secretary of All India Kisan Sabha, and who took most of the pictures that you just saw. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm in PowerPoint, but um, my name is Robert Burns. I'd like to really thank ICI for supporting my research and my ideas and being very uh, great throughout the whole process. Um, my project working title is Set in the Setting, uh, Hong Kong Psychedelia, which I don't like and it will change during the course of the project. Um, but uh, I apologize for the lack of context in what I'm about to present. Um, five minutes is not a lot, so feel, please feel free to like, ask questions at the end. Um, so my project is still pending IRB approval, um, but my proposal is roughly based around analyzing examples of quietism and cultural feedback in psychedelic drug users. Uh, and it's set in a very unlike unlikely location of Hong Kong, wherein uh, post-political upheaval of 2019, uh, the implementation of a national security law and stricter than normal COVID-19 regulations. Um, I've been informed of a few individual former activists um, who talk about psychedelic drugs such as LSD, assisting them in coming to terms with a, a rapidly changing home city and new constraints. Um, in turn, the language they use to describe their experiences is reminiscent of an American therapeutic culture and the contemporary discussion around hallucinogens as medicine for mental illness. Um, now, just to clarify, this is not a really statistically big number. Um, I'm simply interested in taking a few individual reports as examples uh, or insights into other philosophical concepts. Um, this got me interested in whether the surrounding culture around psychedelic drugs, um, I call this, or we call this psychedelia, 
or the pharmacological qualities of the drugs themselves promote a sort of uh, quietism as opposed to activism. Um, this is not a new assumption, but in fact, inspired by the historical circumstances of, of American 1960s, which is the so-called heyday of psychedelic research, uh, wherein compounds like LSD, mescaline, MDMA were being tested for things from military use, mind control, psychotherapy, and all uh, other uh, interesting, strange, weird endeavors. Um, so Timothy Leary, uh, probably the most infamous supporter of psychedelic quietism, urged masses to turn on, tune in, and drop out, uh, basically to withdraw from politics altogether. Um, and I don't think this is what Hong Kongers are doing at all. Um, I don't think people are dropping out. In fact, I think this is much more interesting because uh, there's actually an inability to be activists, uh, whereas in America, there is plenty of opportunities and reason uh, for the counterculture to actually revolutionize. Um, instead, my plan is to interview people on their thoughts about the world, finding out their interpretations of psychedelia, which is not uh, which is now a hot topic of conversation sort of the world over um, uh, and complicate the binary between activism and quietism. Uh, so in other words, uh, do physical constraints such as uh, the limits placed on the national placed by the national security law, which include uh, sensitivity around free speech and uh, obviously no mass gatherings, um, as well as strict COVID-19 regulations such as long quarantines in and out of Hong Kong, uh, vaccine ID passports in a very establishment, even though these have been lifted in the past couple of weeks. Um, uh, I mean, the travel uh, part has. But um, so do these factors turn the outward revolutionary spirit inwards? Um, and I mean, not only are Hong Kongers more open and interested to psychedelics, uh, but there have popped up numerous intellectual and artistic outlets as of recent. Uh, the CUHK professor, Gordon Matthews, notes that students have become increasingly intellectually curious um, Consequently, media outlets that create a communal discussion around uh, the humanities, art, and things like philosophy, such as Corrupt the Youth, which is a really uh, kind of big YouTube channel uh, right now in Hong Kong and is kind of like has these lecture series around the city. Um, these sort of outlets have gained lots of popularity within the past year or two. Um, coincidentally, I stumbled upon this book uh, by the UC Davis anthropologist uh, Li Jiang called uh, Anxious China, uh, Psychotherapy and the Politics of Inner Revolution. Um, so although her ethnography is, not, is around Kunming, not Hong Kong, uh, Jang greatly details how Western-style psychotherapy aids towards what she calls an ever inner revolution. And that can happen when a country like China goes through large-scale uh, social and economic changes. Um, for example, the individualizing aspect and self-centric nature of psychological care aids in the transition from a socialist government to one based more on neoliberal values such as the entrepreneurship of the self uh, shifting uh, responsibility of problems away from the community level and towards the individual. This made me think deeper about uh, cultural translation of what James Nolan uh, terms the American therapeutic culture. And if it has an effect on Hong Kongers who use psychedelics that in contemporary discourse are being popularized at the moment for things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, and, and whatever, whatever else. Um, Nolan posits that in the first chapter of the th therapeutic state that therapists psychological professionals included have come to replace police, priests and clergymen in their, in their role in society. Um, and I would go further to say that psychedelics add this layer of mysticism to psychotherapy, sort of uh, proves in, in some kind of innate thing in human beings, which psychoanalysis and all these other theories have tried to prove uh, and uh, kind of go off in these divergent ways. Um, but in turn, the focus on psychological well-being posits, uh, as Nolan says, mental health as the modern equivalent of salvation. Um, in America, psychedelic mysticism, mysticism borderlines orientalism, but in Hong Kong, how is the American orientalist psychedelic culture perceived is really what I'm interested in. And turning back there, um, I'm interested in how the pursuit of positive mental health states as posited by the current mental health industry. Uh, just a note, there's over 600 psycho, uh, psychedelic psychotherapy startups in existence right now and counting, um, which are all about to make a, a, a big load of money very soon. <laughs> strangely. Um, how does this translate into the cultural dimension of current day Hong Kong? Uh, thanks so much. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Layla. I'm a PhD student in anthropology. My summer research project, um, my, my dissertation project really, is about how a small city in China called Sanmi uses a digital bidding and procurement platform to control drug prices. So basically how, how they uh, leverage bulk purchasing to, to suppress drug prices. 
So I'm very interested in the techniques and instruments that uh, state actors, uh, actors of state deploy to combat rising drug prices set by powerful multinational pharmaceutical companies. Although we, we're all, although like the among the pharmaceutical companies, there are also a lot of local, uh, very local companies as well. Um, but since I haven't actually been able to thoroughly analyze my data from the summer yet, instead of uh, my actual projects, then I'm mostly going to talk about what happened this summer and then the practicalities of remote field work, uh, which to me is, is really new. And hopefully it'll be of interest and use to, uh, for other people who are thinking about doing this kind of field work in China soon. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so I've been studying this topic for a while now, but due to COVID, as you as you all know, I haven't been able to go back to China for field work for a while. So up until this summer, my project um, kind of remained and still remained at a very conceptual stage. I didn't have a lot of field work data to back anything up, and I, I didn't actually have real contacts locally. So so I was in a pretty dire situation. And then and then on top of that, the longer the project stalled, the le le like the less motivated I also became. So it was like a downwards a death spiral kind of. So I, I must say it was really fortunate that I received this ICI funding funding because it really injected a lot of momentum back to, into my project. Uh, so thanks to the funding, I was able to hire a local research assistant in spring 2022. Um, and, and with her, I pre we, prepare, we started preparing for remote field work. But just backing up, I also want to say that like hiring a research assistant was not as easy as I thought. And that for that, I also uh, actually thanks to ICI and, and Helen, uh, Helen, uh, uh, yeah, thanks to Helen's connection, who introduced me to her academic networks on WeChat, I was able to find somebody quickly, but I was trying to do it myself and I couldn't. So anyway, there's a lot of difficulty even before anything even started. Um, so this research assistant, um, she's currently a master's student in anthropology in Beijing. But what really appeared to me, oh, sorry, appealed to me was that was other than her excellent background, uh, was that she was, she was an undergraduate in Xiamen University. Oh, let me, uh, let me show Xiamen University, which is actually not far from Sanming, and they're both in Beijing. And I was sorry, so they're both in Fujian. Uh, and I was really hoping that she could leverage her Xiamen University networks and find somebody local in Sanming. And and then lo and behold, she actually delivered. Um, she found um, a, a shishong, a, a, like a senior classmate of hers. Uh, turns out that he has a friend from Xiamen University's medical school. And then this doctor friend, I'm just going to call him Dr. Lee, which is a, a, a pseudonym. Uh, this doctor, uh, Dr. Lee, was originally from Sanming. And then after graduating, he returned to Sanming to work as a doctor. He's a pretty junior. And, and then Dr. Lee also happens to be very interested in healthcare reforms himself. You know, I mean, like, it, 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 in, in addition to drug prices, the healthcare reforms also deal with like physician compensation and stuff, which of course touches him very directly. So he had a, he had an intellectual and material interest in this project. So he was very generous with his time and connections. So with this connection secured, um, Eve and I really began to plan for an actual trip this for the summer. And, and our primary objective, of course, was to talk to government officials who had uh, who have who were involved in this in this project, um, this reforms, right? But because we didn't have any connections at that time, I, I really have very low hopes, right? So I was trying to manage my expectations. Uh, but so so on the one hand, we plan to meet up with Dr. Lee and talk to his colleagues, and on the other hand, also plan like various plan Bs and plan Cs in case no one wants to talk to her. Um, and yeah, so, but turns out my expectations were blown away. And I also learned many valuable lessons about doing field work in China. Um, so just very quickly, I'm already almost out of time. Uh, Eve, for, Eve was able to talk to, thanks to Dr. Lee's connections, Eve was able to talk to a handful of doctors and a handful of patients really at length in detail, uh, and sometimes uh, with follow-ups. And, and then she found like materials that I've been looking for, but I couldn't find online in a, like local bookstores. Um, and she, on the last day, she visited the local medical insurance department. Um, and after being almost kicked out completely, she managed to, through like her persistence, and would manage to speak to an administrator and then through of the platform and then through the administrator she actually spoke to a higher level director who was apparently a founding member of the local health reform so we were really really lucky um and and it's also not just pure luck um Oh, and, and through that that um, director we were able to actually speak to an engineer of the bidding and procurement platform 
Um, and then when the field work was over, Eve left something and went to Chapman. So this was supposed to be over, but then she found out that a, a, a founding reformer was actually giving a talk. So luckily we also got to attend the talk, me virtually. Um, and so it was, it was really, it was really crazy. Um, so just very quickly to sum up, um, I, I hope to share some insights and lessons I learned from this experience. Um, and I think my main takeaway is that with a project in China that deals with officials or even just regular professionals and professional organizations, I, I realized that having proper letters and introductions is re really important, which sounds like really dumb to me. Like I was, I, I had, I had no idea. I was, I was really naive and I kind of went in blind, but um, you know, it, I learned that letters and introductions is extremely important. <laughs> I hope that you guys can, can learn this now, you know, uh, um, and, and you know, be more prepared than I was. So, and I also learned that without these connections and formal artifacts, even your family members will really help you. <laughs> and um, and on top of that, uh, it's probably best to have, a, I think, a local partner working closely with you because in my experience, what, what happened was that Chinese officials and administrators, and even just regular professionals are very sensitive and, and kind of um, reserved about participating in foreign research. So, um, so it depends on the subject matter of your research. Um, uh, I think this, this should invite a lot of consideration when you design your research um, uh, because it, I mean, it, it affects uh, access, but it also may mean that you might be unknowingly asking people to take on a lot of risk, personal risk for your own benefit. So um, yeah, so anyway, this is, these are my uh, early takeaways, very, very rough. So thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, it's just, I'm, I'm blown away by the uh, depth and quality of, and, and your ability to put so much information into just the, the five minutes that were allotted to you. Um, let's give everyone a, a big hand for those amazing presentations. Um, we have time for just a, a, a question or two, and I'd be happy to take them uh, as you're formulating them. Um, I will say that uh, thinking about applications for next year, you saw uh, a, an amazing batch of what turned out to be this year, a lot of social science kind of focused papers, political economy, labor, capital, uh, really amazing set of, of presentations. Um, we also, uh, of course, welcome uh, uh, proposals to, from students in performing arts uh, in, uh, design. So um, I don't want us to come away from today's presentations with the impression that, oh, I'm, I, I don't do social science, so I, I, I won't get the grant. We just happen to have a, a, a large quality and quantity of social science type of applications and history uh, last year. Uh, so uh, the floor is now open for questions or comments uh, to one or a couple of, of the presenters. <laughs> 